Welcome to Well-Being and Ethics in the Legal Profession, General Considerations and COVID-19 Implications, sponsored by the ABA Section of Taxation. If you are seeking CLE credit, you must attend the entire program. Partial credit is not available. Please click on all participation verification alerts during the program to confirm your attendance. Immediately after the program ends, a link to complete the certification process will appear. Please complete the evaluation and the CLE affidavit, providing your bar information as requested. Once the completed form is submitted and your attendance verified, your certificate will be emailed to you. Moderating the program today is Tom Kane. Tom, you may proceed with the program. Thank you. First, I'd like to briefly introduce the rest of today's panel. Joining me on the program are the Honorable Ronald Book from the United States Tax Court, um, Joseph Rolota, and Amanda Smith. Uh, judge Book, as I just noted, is a judge of the United States Tax Court in Washington, D.C. Joe is a partner with Fager, Drinker, Biddle, and Reef LLP in Washington, D.C. Amanda is Chief Engagement Officer of Morgan Lewis and Bacchius LLP in New York. Uh, I believe there are further and more extensive bios associated with this program if you want to learn a little bit more about today's panelists. After this presentation, participants can be expected to identify key health and well-being issues generally affecting their communities and more specifically affecting the legal profession, understand the relationship between well-being and legal ethics, understand key considerations in designing and implementing well-being programs, and understand the well-being and ethical implications related to COVID-19. Um, a few brief remarks before we dive into um, the program itself. Um, first, I would like to thank um, the section on taxation for sponsoring this program. I believe COLAP, which is the ABA Commission on Lawyer Assistance Programs, uh, has co-sponsored this session. Um, and they are actually a collaborator on, a, on a, a report that we're going to be spending some time um, later in this program on that directly affects the intersection between legal uh, well-being programs and legal ethics. Um, second of all, just note that May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and uh, we are going to be doing our best um, as part of this program um, to highlight some mental health issues affecting the legal profession uh, and legal ethics. And hopefully this is our effort towards uh, contributing to Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and third, um, completely off topic, but um, for the last three months, we've heard a lot about um, the, the important work being done by a lot of people in connection with the current pandemic. Um, I've listened to a lot of it, watched a lot of it. Um, I haven't seen or heard um, a real serious acknowledgement about the role the legal profession is playing in all aspects of, of, of dealing with the pandemic. Um, but I haven't seen any issue that, that to, to any extent, um, acknowledge the contributions of the legal profession. Um, and so I would just like to acknowledge the contributions of the legal profession to the ongoing pandemic uh, and the work that everybody on this call and everybody else in the profession is doing to contribute um, to getting through this very, very difficult set of circumstances. Um, the, this panel uh, has been a work in process for probably over a year and a half or two years. Um, I see almost hourly announcements about well-being programs um, or COVID-19 programs. Um, 
this is Ron Vuk. I will, as we wait for Tom to get back on the line, um, I'll just go ahead and, and jump into the next bit of the topic and we'll circle back. Um, I'll, I'll back up to Tom's slide and, um, and I want to highlight the first item here that, you know, when we talk about health, um, what we're talking about is a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being. And uh, so um, we're not just talking about um, the, the, the types of, uh, uh, you know, medical visits like, like broken legs. We're talking about things like emotional health as well. And there are lots of things that go along with emotional health. One of them that's common that we see is um, the prevalence of illicit drug use that goes uh, along with um, mental health issues. And the statistics that we've just put on the screen here show statistics uh, not specific to the legal profession, we'll, we will turn to that, but um, just general within the United States. And you know, a number like 11.2%, these are 2017 statistics, doesn't look like a particularly high number in, until you actually read the text that goes along with it. And that's illicit drug use in the past month. Um, and, and so w if we were to look at a broader population, the number would be much higher. Um, and, and so there is uh, illicit drug use is, is rampant. Uh, and then non-medical use of, of uh, psychotherapeutic drugs, uh, the, again, the percentage looks low, but that, that's a pretty narrow category. You often hear, for example, about um, things like people taking uh, Adderall without a prescription. That's a common one that's talked about. Um, and then uh, drug overdose deaths, uh, again, the number there, nearly 70,000 people annually dying from drug overdose in the United States. Um, alcohol use, and, and really our focus here is... Um, is more on alcohol abuse. Uh, percentage of adults 18 and over, heavy drinking. Um, we see that it's a, a quarter of the population. Um, and then the things that go along with alcohol abuse, uh, liver disease deaths, um, and then alcohol-induced deaths. And again, an important piece of this is excluding accidents and homicides. Uh, a, a high percentage of um, violence reported to the police, including homicides, um, is alcohol related. Suicide and self-inflicted injury, again, this is general for the United States. Um, uh, you know, 273,000 self-inflicted injury cases in 2016. Um, and then we see deaths by suicide nearing um, 50,000. Uh, again, from, from the same year. Uh, top 10 in terms of causes of death. Uh, we, uh, those of us on this panel gave this, uh, a, a variation of this presentation live. And I think one of the comments I made in that presentation at the time is um, that, that I think shocked some people is uh, I have had to identify the body of a colleague which is why this particular issue is, hits particularly hard with me when we talk about these kinds of statistics and as they relate to the legal profession. Um, health and wellness, we get here, the, uh, this slide largely focuses on, um, I will refer to it as obesity. You'll see there's some statistics in there regarding diabetes, but there's a, there's a high co correlation between um, diabetes and obesity. And what we see here is um, uh, people sort of misunderstand the terms of obesity and overweight. Uh, you, you hear about the, the high percentage of people who in the United States are obese, um, but that is, is another way to think of that is very overweight. Uh, if you look at the second bullet there, you see 71% of the population in the United States um, is overweight. That would include people who are obese. Um, about 15% of the, the population with diabetes. Um, and again, diabetes causes um, a number of other health issues, um, including, uh, it, as is indicated down here, uh, about 12% of emergency room visits and can lead to death. Um, mental health statistics, 
we see here again uh, psychological distress 3.9 percent and again I don't want to go through and read a bunch of uh, a bunch of statistics off um, but you see uh, st uh, statistics here regarding um, depression and other uh, mental and behavioral health issues uh, one thing that I will, you know, and we're going to talk more specifically about COVID-19, coronavirus, et cetera, later, but um, I have been unable to locate any uh, COVID-19 specific statistics other than this. Um, uh, the Lancet, which is the Journal of Psychiatry, um, also has, has acknowledged that there are no current COVID-19 statistics, but one of the things that they've been able to do is estimate what is in specifically what is the effect of unemployment? And, and reading now from Lancet, um, in a previous study, we modeled the effect of unemployment on suicide on the basis of global public data from 63 countries. And we observed that suicide risk was elevated by 20 to 30% when associated with unemployment as a result of the 2008 economic crisis. So um, when we look at things like mental health issues, suicide and self-injury, et cetera. Um, these are of particular concern during the current outbreak, um, just because we can see from history things like unemployment, and there is a significant amount of it today, do cause a risk in mental health issues and in, in including suicide and self-injury. If we take a look at the legal profession, and you can go down through these statistics, and they are almost across the board higher than the norm for the population. Um, so depression during the career, 45% of, of attorneys, 12% um, having suicidal thoughts at least once uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, alcohol abuse, 21%. Um, the, the highest rate seems to be in the first 10 years of the career. I suppose that's not entirely surprising. Um, prescription drug abuse, you see there the 9%. Um, and then if, if you work in a law firm and you have any concern about your risk for malpractice, so if, if you set aside the human issue and the caring with and caring for your, your colleagues and employees, et cetera, um, if you want to look at it straight from an economic percent perspective, 70% um, of malpractice is associated with some sort of substance abuse. So whether from a, on a human level or on an economic risk level, um, these health-related statistics should be important to uh, any legal employer. And with that, I will hand it off. Hey, this is uh, Tom again. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm back, sorry I got cut off earlier. Um, this is probably a good point just to pick up uh, one of the points I was gonna make before we hit these slides. And, and it has to do um, with the definitions of, of health that were um, up on one of the earlier slides. And let me see if I can find it and pull it up. Because um, this is important um, in terms of this whole presentation and the process. Um, usually when you talk about ethics and legal ethics um, from law school, to taking the multi-state exam to um, being up to date with bar certifications. We learn the rules, we learn how the rules have been um, violated by court cases, by disciplinary proceedings. Um, we're tested on those and hopefully um, we inform ourselves as we go forward. Before you get to that point, um, there are conduct issues um, that lead to um, up to uh, where where we get to a point where we violate the ethical rules. And I think one of the big points of this program is we're going to be talking about how to prevent or humiliate um, those those conduct issues, those behavior issues through well-being programs that can improve and inform our ethical conduct. And it's important to note that when you phrase it like that, what we're really talking about are health issues and specifically public health issues. And on this slide, um, we have two definitions. One is basically the definition of health from the World Health Organization. 
um, which is the, the, the prototype definition um, that everyone in public health uses. Second bullet um, deals with um, an, uh, a statement from the report that, that was done by the National Task Force on Attorney Wellbeing, um, which we're going to be talking about in a few minutes at length. And, and it also defines lawyer well-being in terms of health. Besides the fact that one definition is much longer than the other, um, and maybe that's due to the fact that some people think we lawyers get paid by words, um, their definitions are surprisingly simple, similar. Um, and, and, and and I think that's an important point because as we work through well-being issues, well-being and wellness programs, we can draw on an existing body of knowledge that's out there in the public health field um, to inform um, how we move forward with well-being programs in the legal profession. If public health deals with population health, um, preventing bad things happening through workable programs, um, we certainly have that here. Our population is the legal profession. We want to, to enhance well-being, certainly, but, but enhance it to a point where it, it allows us to act more ethically through well-being programs, which are basically interventions. Um, we look a lot like the public health field that has existed for the past 100 years. And so the slides that Judge Book just went through demonstrates that we have a problem, society has a problem, and there are ways to deal with that, including but not limited to ways to deal with that in a way that could inform the ethics of our profession. And with that, I will turn it back over to Amanda. Um, or is it Joe? Joe, um, Joe I think, I think I'm up next, Tom. Yep, thanks. Thanks, Tom. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me first uh, commend to you uh, the, uh, the Krill article that she referenced at the bottom of slide 10 there. Uh, really, all, all of the articles referenced in the deck, um, they're easy to find. And uh, if, even if you're someone like me uh, who does not have a public health background or, or mental health uh, care background, they're, they're fairly accessible. And, and they're eye openers. Um, Krill, in particular, uh, paints a, a pretty candid and comprehensive picture of our profession. And it, uh, it shows that we have some issues uh, that we need to work through collectively. And, and um, that literature really set in motion, as we'll describe in a bit, uh, some efforts by the ABA and by various organizations in the law to, to begin to address. Uh, these mental health and wellness concerns. Um, it also articulates, the literature also articulates some of the factors that uh, may contribute to these uh, wellness and mental health issues. And you see some of them um, here on slide 11. Um, again, if, if you don't come uh, at this from a, a public health background, you may not be familiar with the vocabulary you may not have uh, had occasion before to really consider this in sort of a structured and analytical way that these authors do. But I'll bet you just from um, our, our lived experience in the profession, a lot of this rings true. Uh, and these aren't necessarily factors that are unique to the legal profession, uh, but, but they're ones that, that uh, seem to be associated with it to one degree or another. Um, for one thing, uh, there is burnout. It's all it's easy to conceptualize what burnout is, and probably most of us have experienced it at one level or another. Uh, this is a demanding profession, um, especially when you have, for whatever reason, a less than ideal set of working circumstances that can create a lot of stress, uh, as, as it's uh, articulated here, physical and emotional exhaustion uh, that comes from... Uh, uh, some combination of low job satisfaction, um, perceived unreasonable demands, gaps between expectations and outcomes. The good news is that burnout can be relatively 
uh, easily addressed, at least in some circumstances, by a change in, in work circumstances, a job change, uh, provision of increased uh, support, uh, increased resources, that sort of thing. Uh, there, there are other factors that are perhaps um, and not, not unique to the uh, legal profession, but perhaps more unique to the helping professions of, of which the law is one, and you see these articulated here, uh, compassion fatigue, uh, just the cumulative effect of, of being exposed uh, to you know, perhaps challenging interactions with someone who needs you to be an empathetic here. Um, there's, there's vicarious uh, trauma um, sometimes uh, when you're working with uh, or for a client that uh, has these difficult things happen to him or her, uh, the stress of that wears on you as well. Uh, again, uh, you, we may not have had occasion to think of these uh, experiences in these clinical terms, but I'll bet you each and every one of us has experienced these to some degree. Uh, and I, I'm certain that, that the, uh, those of us on, on the panel here can, can testify to one extent or another, uh, if, if we, you know, especially if we work in, uh, in, in family law or in criminal law or in uh, high stakes uh, litigation, one sort or another, uh, you're going to be under this sort of pressure and that can contribute uh, over time uh, to, to a deterioration uh, of, of um, wellness. So uh, Krill, and the rest of the literature uh, sort of inspired the ABA in 2016, 2017, in conjunction uh, with, with other uh, organizations to uh, begin uh, formulating um, at least the beginning of a plan of action. Uh, and as uh, Judge Book noted, and this was rightly, this set of issues was rightly perceived to be not only uh, a, um, a matter that goes to uh, you know, being compassionate and caring for our colleagues and coworkers, but also preserving uh, the, uh, and, and maintaining the integrity of the profession uh, because these uh, wellness issues can and often do compromise uh, our, our work. And so uh, the ABA, uh, together with the National Organization of Bar Council and the American Association of Professional Responsibility Lawyers uh, formed the, the National Task Force on Lawyer Wellbeing, which in turn came out with a report uh, in mid-2017, and you'll see on the next couple of slides excerpts from the cover letter that accompanied this report. According to the task force, uh, it makes reference to these findings that we've discussed and notes that these are incompatible with a sustainable legal profession, and they raise troubling implications for many lawyers' basic competence task force goes on to say that it's necessary to maintain public confidence in the profession to act on these issues. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Amanda to uh, start the discussion of, of what the task force specifically has recommended. So thanks so much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, I think it's really important to note that at the, at the outset, the report of the National Task Force took some time to lay out, in its view, the reasons why it was important for the profession and the ABA to take action on what is accurately described, I think, as a, as a, uh, a health crisis, a behavioral health crisis within the profession. And, you know, that, I think, is, is evidenced by the statistics that the judge went through earlier. Um, the first was referenced, and, and I think it's important to note it, um, especially for all of, all of uh, you on the phone or listening to the presentation who are seeking information about how to uh, advocate for a well-being program within your, your firm or at, at, uh, if you have another legal employer. Uh, the first is really what I, I think is quite obviously the business case, um, you know, lawyer well-being is important to uh, the cognitive functioning of lawyers and uh, without it uh, the 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 legal professionals uh, at your at your firm or your organization will be unable to do their best work it's very important just to acknowledge that that it is um, a, an underlying business imperative for legal employers to function 
uh, to focus rather on well-being. Um, I, I don't say that in order to to um, be emphasize the transactional nature of it, but I think uh, all of us in the panel would agree that it's Im important to marshal your arguments because the development of a well-being program is a significant investment, and I think it would uh, it's always helpful to be able to to reference this as a an underlying benefit um, or an eventual benefit to a significant investment in lawyer well-being. Second, and really the topic of our, our panel today, is the fact that there is an obvious connection between lawyer well-being and the ability of a lawyer to ethically practice law. Um, the duty of competence, the duty of diligence, as reflected in the model rules of professional conduct, um, are certainly implicated uh, when you are impaired, um, and if and you could have that impairment because of a substance misuse issue, you could have that impairment because of a mental health issue, such as depression or anxiety. Um, there's a, a body of uh, material, and I don't want to uh, recite it in detail here, but there's a body of materials that is, as you would imagine confirms that uh, that lawyers who uh, suffer through substance misuse or depression or both um, uh, really really do um, it can have an impact on uh, on that lawyer's competence uh, as was referenced earlier I think by the judge um, there is a very significant percentage up to 70 percent of disciplinary proceedings and malpractice claims against lawyers which involve these behavioral health issues um, so it is really important for us to focus in on the uh, the professional responsibility um, I will note here that the uh, that there is a tension here I think um, as those of us who have started well-being programs at our firms or at our organizations can attest one of the critical steps that that you really must take in order to try to address this crisis is to reduce the stigma associated with uh, with behavioral health issues in order to uh, encourage your colleagues to seek help. Um, and uh, I think it's pretty well acknowledged that the fact that there is this uh, that there is this connection with competence, with concerns about competence and concerns about um, about diligence has made it difficult to reduce that stigma. There is that much more reluctance to for a, an attorney to raise her hand, um, to acknowledge that there is an issue, to seek help. Um, and, and that is a barrier that we all really do need to uh, to, to think about and work through as we as we seek to develop effective well-being programs. Um, so as I said, uh, certainly there is no dearth of evidence about the connection between these substance misuse problems and uh, and, and ethical concerns. Um, third, and, and really most importantly, uh, I'm sure we can all agree, is that the promotion of well-being is just the right thing to do. Um, you know, we, we all have stories um, that uh, about uh, colleagues, family members, friends who have um, suffered with untreated mental health and substance misuse disorders, and um, that can have profound impacts on lives and families and careers. Um, and so uh, there is really a, a sense collectively that just purely from a human perspective, promoting well-being, um, whether, you know, in, in, in whatever sector of the profession you sit, uh, is, is really important just, just for um, humanitarian reasons. Uh, and with that, I think I will turn it over to. Uh, I'll I'll pick it up from here. Um, and so uh, we we have on here a, a, a series of selected recommendations, and, and um, you know, acknowledging that you know we the, the legal profession we are in, we are in business, whether you're in government, you're you know, or or in private practice, or wherever you're at. You know, we are in the business of, of doing legal work, but we also need to make sure that we are taking the right balance. And and the first one here is simply to acknowledge the problem and take responsibility. And um, if if you're hearing any of this and you're thinking, well, well, this doesn't apply to me or my firm or my employer, um, then reread number one and just sort of stay there until you can think about ways, because if it's uh, with the percentage of the 
legal profession that has the kinds of problems we've outlined, um, they in all likelihood affect uh, every employer out there. So these recommendations, this first set of recommendations is really for all employers. Um, and so, you know, demonstrating a commitment to well-being, um, and, and one way to demonstrate a commitment to well-being is for the leaders of a firm, first and foremost, to take care of themselves, um, but also to, to set the right model for um, those within a firm or an agency. Um, and, you know, for example, uh, the, the third bullet, you know, destigmatizing uh, uh, health care and, and encouraging, um, you know, help seeking behaviors. Uh, you know, if there is a conflict between um, between getting help and getting work done, um, getting help ought to be the priority and making health a priority. And by the way, th that might sound obvious, but there are a lot of little things that firms and that employers do um, that might not seem like they contribute to the problem. But uh, as we look down, and, and I'm going to skip the, the third bullet from the last, you know, de-emphasize alcohol at social events. Um, you know, lots of firms out there, lots of employers have uh, employer happy hours. Um, you know, one is, is you know, de-emphasize or eliminate alcohol at those kinds of events, but certainly make sure there are um, non-alcoholic options and, and that those who choose the non-alcoholic options aren't stigmatized. Um, I'll give you another one that we, uh, we had a, on the slide earlier about weight. Um, uh, I, I know one firm out there has an afternoon dessert cart. Um, well, if, if weight is an issue, if uh, diabetes is an issue out there, um, maybe a dessert cart isn't the right issue. What about balanced choices? Um, if you attended a CLE and at the break there is a tray of cookies and brownies and a bowl of M&Ms for the taking, um, or if you're hosting one of those kinds of events, uh, are uh, fruit or vegetables viable options that are out there that make for healthier choices? Um, and when you have social events, um, does it have to be a drinking event? Um, you know, you could just as easily have uh, a Friday afternoon yoga or Friday or a, a, a Wednesday morning run or, um, you know, or meditation. And uh, if you are rolling your eyes at any of those things, then I would say go back and read number one and acknowledge the problem and think about ways to take responsibility and create a more helpful working environment. Um, and then obviously a big one that I wanted to jump back to is to provide high quality education programs um, and, and provide really means by which uh, employees have access to help when they need it. And I think Amanda and Joe will talk more about that in a minute. Um, within the, the courts, um, I think the first, you know, the same thing, communicating that well-being is a priority. I think the first thing to remember is that courts, just like um, law firms or just like government agencies, we are employers also. So we need to have policies and, and take actions that um, take care of our judicial colleagues and our employees and do all of the kinds of things that, that I've just described in the previous slide. I think the additional, um, the real additional thing that, that we as judges have to pay attention to is really the last bullet on this slide, and that is keep an eye out for impaired lawyers, um, and, and we do see it. Uh, we see erratic behavior by lawyers, um, and we may not be able to identify that it is at some sort of substance abuse issue, but it, is, it does happen where we see erratic behavior by lawyers, and we, you know, we take steps to protect the party in the case, um, and then we may see sometime later that somebody has, been, has had action taken by them by their state bar association. Etc. So, so it is a real issue that we see in the courts. And then we move on to regulators, which I think is back to Tom. Yeah, I, I think this is back to me. Um, before we get to this slide, I just want to catch up with a couple of comments um, on on several of the previous slides. Um, 
stigma now has been mentioned several times, and I think uh, Judge Boo um, made a really terrific point about everyone trying to um, lessen the burden of stigma, and whether it's the leaders of a law practice, um, the you know the leaders of the court system, um, we're all leaders in this effect in this in this matter, um, and recognizing that stigma um, is a barrier to good health, whether it's mental health or physical health, is, is a long, goes a long way um, to, to ensuring the, the health of the profession. And, and, and I do think that's important. Um, Joe on a previous slide highlighted um, the study that was done by um, Patrick Krill and others. Um, you know, Patrick was a member of the the, the commission that put together the task force report um, has done some excellent work in this area. You know, I, I would note um, it's more of an advertisement than anything else at this point. Um, those of you who are members of the DC bar um, have been getting um, emails lately indicating that there's going to be a, a survey coming up um, about um, mental health. Um, I, I think that survey is, is being, has been put together um, by Patrick and some of his colleagues and, and taking advantage of providing input to the bar and to the people people working with the bar on our views, our collective views, our individual views of, of what health and well-being means for our profession is really important to getting a handle on what the profession can and should be doing. And so whether it's the DC bar or any other bar um, that makes outreach efforts along those lines, we would encourage you um, to spend a few minutes um, to help um, understand um, what the bar needs, what the profession needs, and what we can do to make things better. Um, the National Task Force as, as, as Judge Book mentioned, made a number of recommendations. He's already covered, I think, two of the key sets. There is a third set for regulators, um, and, and this would be the bar authorities, uh, the disciplinary authorities, um, that focus specifically on, on lawyer well-being, um, adopt regulatory objectives that prioritize lawyer well-being, modify the rules of professional conduct to endorse well-being as part of a lawyer's duty of competence. Um, the slides uh, that we've covered um, to this point have mentioned at least twice um, that um, the lawyer's duty of competence, which is in the model rules, is the first model rule, 1.1, duty of competence, um, has mentioned them twice. Um, and it's important to understand and, and clearly um, acknowledge the linkage between ethics and well-being when it comes to um, the way we operate within our profession. Expand continuing education requirements to include well-being topics. I have to say that with all of the well-being panels um, that I receive emails on on a really regular daily basis, um, this is being um, uh, pursued uh, in, in, in a, in a well-targeted uh, fashion, and I, I think the profession is, is, is taking this issue to heart. Implement proactive management-based programs that include well, lawyer well-being components. Adopt a centralized grievance intake system to prompt, promptly identify well-being concerns. Modify confidentiality rules to allow one-way sharing of lawyer well-being related information from regulators to lawyer assistance programs. Note that this goes to LAPs um, and not necessarily to law firms, employers, or the profession in general. Adopt diversion programs and other alternatives to discipline that are proven. Um, and I do think this is, a, this is an important component um, because when you're dealing with health, whether it's physical or mental health related issues, um, one of the things that clearly concerns people who may have problems in this area 
is the potential discipline that 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 they can be subject to if for some reason because of a medical condition um they're 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 found to have uh, not met the basic ethical standards of the profession um and just like there are uh, mental health courts and substance abuse courts uh in the general court systems um you know a suggestion along these lines is a very worthy consideration uh, for people to take a look at. So the, uh, the panel wanted to direct your attention also to recommendations for legal employers. Um, that's very broad. I'll just briefly note on the next slide that there are other recommendations uh, in the report of the National Task Force for law schools, bar associations, and so on. But we wanted to spend some time talking about recommendations for legal employers. Both Joe and I have been very directly involved in developing the well-being programs at our firms and have navigated some of um, some of these issues. And we wanted to give you the benefit of our experience. Um, as, as was said earlier, there are a large number of, in particular, law firms that are uh, developing um, really more and more sophisticated programs. Um, all, there are also, of course, in-house legal departments that are embracing um, this, these kinds of initiatives and, and other legal employers. Um, the, the report lays out some fairly common sense uh, recommendations for legal employers who are seeking to uh, as assist their workforce um, and, and recognizing that the statistics that we went through earlier are almost certainly equally applicable to uh, the, the people within their own organization. And I'm the, I, I endorse and I think the panel endorses all of these. Um, the report really is, has a wealth of information. So these are just some excerpts, but uh, some very straightforward things that can be done immediately are to form a lawyer well-being committee. Uh, we've done that at our firm and have really made a, uh, an effort to get buy-in from all uh, parts of the organization. Our Lawyer Wellbeing Committee is international. It is, includes our offices outside of the United States, and I think that's really important. Um, uh, assess lawyers' well-being. I will note that, and I'm interested if any of the panelists have thoughts about this, this has proven to be a little bit tricky. Um, there are some pretty significant privacy issues associated with um, asking uh, uh, lawyers to report on on their health, um, but it is really important, even if done on a more anecdotal basis, to get a sense, uh, even a baseline sense, of where your your population is. Um, certainly, monitoring uh, your population for um, the signs of behavioral health issues is really important. Um, and, and often, it, especially in very large firms. That is, or large legal employers, that's going to mean educating the heads of practice, the heads of practice groups or uh, managing partners of offices and the HR function to I identify those signs. Um, some of them are not necessarily um, as obvious as you might think. Um, uh, actively combating social isolation and encouraging interconnectivity. Obviously, one of the focuses of our panel today is on how the current pandemic it has it interrelates with these issues about well-being within the legal profession. And we talked about it a bit earlier, and really, I, I think we all agree that these comments and recommendations that were made by the task force, many of them are, are exponentially more important now. Um, the social isolation that is being experienced by many uh, lawyers um, who are sheltering in place alone uh, is is really a a huge trigger for many um, with respect to behavioral health issues. So encouraging interconnectivity has really been an important uh, uh, an important issue. Um, and I will say, you know, I think firms do that and legal employers do that in order to ensure client service, but it is equally as important to ensure the overall collective well-being of the organization. Emphasize the service-centered mission. I think that this one is extremely important. Um, there is a huge connection between personal philanthropy and there's a whole science of giving and why uh, one of the most important things that you can do to ensure your own personal well-being 
um, is to uh, is to give to others and help others. Um, and then finally, create standards, align incentives, and give feedback. Um, this, I think, is a, a very efficient shorthand way to describe the creation of a culture of well-being, a culture of respect for well-being within the workplace. Um, and that's easier said than done, of course. But um, you know, we had a we had a question being raised here by one of our our listeners about how do you non how do you how do you try to promote um, a culture where those who do not use alcohol are not stigmatized? Um, and there's a lot of really different ways that you can do that. Um, you know, one of the things that we've done, for example, is to at firm functions create a sort of specialty mocktail um, that's a um, that's sort of a featured drink. Um, at our last partner meeting, we had um, published on the, the general agenda, Friends of Bill meetings, which I, if, um, if you're not familiar with that term, that's a, a term for um, AA meetings for, for those who are in recovery. So just normalizing, normalizing um, the discussion of um, the fact that, of course, there are people um, within the organization who do not drink. And they may not even be in recovery. There may be religious reasons why they don't drink. They're, they may be pregnant. Um, there might be all sorts of reasons. And um, I think for, for us, it's been very important to um, sort of just be very, very public about that. The other thing, um, and I'll mention this because I think it's so important, and then I'll invite uh, the, our panelists to, to comment because um, we wanted to spend some time on these issues. I think it's really important to um, have leadership of the organization be very candid and straightforward about the issues themselves. Um, you know, this has been a hidden, these, these issues are not new. The behavioral health issues within the profession are not new. We're learning more about them now. And there's a lot of emphasis on it now in large part because of the work of the task force and of Patrick Krill in particular, but they're, they have, they have persisted for many decades. And so, um, Having leaders of organizations be very verbal. Uh, uh, one of our managing partners, Steve Wall, has been very candid about his recovery from alcoholism and has um, gives many talks and talks to the press about it. Um, and and I cannot tell you how important that has been for our organization to help uh, align incentives, create standards, create a culture in which um, the 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 issues are just discussed um, and that's and normalized um, and of course we're going to be discussing them um, because you know our leadership is discussing them so um, I will these are only a few of the recommendations in the in the task force but the what they're the ones that we thought it was really critical um, that we that we put in front of you Joe or any of the other panelists did you want to comment I know we wanted to spend some time talking about these sure you know I this is Joe Amanda I, you know we're we're on the phone so you can't see this, but when you're talking about how important culture and, and leadership are, I'm kind of doing the amen head nod because it's 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 really critical. You can have all of the institutions uh, that are recommended, and they're all good and valuable, um, but if they don't translate into uh, a supportive culture, they don't amount to much. Uh, and and more than probably anything, culture is informed. By the attitudes and the expressions of leadership, so so um, you know, folks with a leadership role in their organization really need to buy in in order to make any of this work. Um, but I, I will say, just as sort of how things kind of progressed, at least for me and for my firm, you know, in the beginning there were mentorship mentorship programs, right? And, and essentially, that's a system of formal and formal networks between. Uh, more senior and more junior attorneys, and, and they weren't designed for attorney wellness issues per se, um, but they kind of filled a little bit of that function, and they remain important because it is, it continues to be for many attorneys, uh, a way to get um, some sort of feedback about the workplace outside of uh, you know the immediate day-to-day -day work of the case team. Uh, and, um, you know, in the beginning, of course, before we created uh, the, these institutions that are recommended by the task force, uh, this, this was all we had, and, um, or it was a lot of what we had, and, and, and it still plays a valuable role. 
and, and part of this is training mentors, training attorneys who are more senior, who are in leadership positions to, to appreciate uh, these issues, to be on the lookout for uh, you know, red flags and to be supportive um, if and as necessary, uh, if there is some sort of stress or distress that you become aware of, particularly at an earlier stage of, of the uh, of progression, because at that point, intervention can be more meaningful and it can present less of the tensions uh, that, yeah. that uh, the panelists have spoken about. But, uh, you know, we, we um, I, don't, I don't think uh, having that formal or informal mentorship program is necessarily enough. I mean, there is some value to uh, a lot of the institutions the firms have adopted more recently. Certainly, uh, we've, we've made more resources available for attorneys. And, and in our firm, this, is, this has been coordinated by uh, a, um, a position that we created called Chief Wellness Officer. Um, we've had the CWO in place for a couple of years, and part of uh, what she's done is, is made sure that these resources are available. And what I'm talking about are, I mean, they, they vary from live presentations to um, you know, videos, presentations that are accessible remotely and, and covering a whole range of topics. Um, and, and, you know, you can, I think, frankly, I'll, I'll confess that I was a little bit skeptical about some of this at the, at the beginning, but, you know, I'm, I'm Reminded of that line from um, the Field of Dreams, you know, if you build it, they, they will come. I mean, if, if you create these programs, people will access them, and they certainly have. We've gotten a lot of views on videos such as, uh, you know, managing workplace stress, work-life balance, uh, mindfulness training, nutrition counseling, even more sort of weighty issues like substance abuse uh, and suicide yeah. prevention. Um, yeah. And and that's that's been it's been valuable and it's been it's been important not only to have this set of resources but also to let people know that they're out there through onboarding and through other uh, mechanisms and processes. That's been an important part of this. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree the, more. CWO is also yeah. No, go ahead, Amanda. Sorry, um, I, I I couldn't agree more with everything that you just said. I think um, you know, Joe, both of us are work at firms that have created that chief wellness officer. Our 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 title, the title of the person at our firm who directs our program is the director of um, well-being, but they're the same position. And those that's a position that didn't exist within the legal profession uh, before two years ago. Um, for you know, that's obviously something that. Um, it, it, to have a full-time person in that role is really great and probably only something that the largest firms could do. Um, but I do think it's really important that even if, even if the scale of the enterprise isn't large enough to accommodate a full-time person, it's really important to make it someone's job. Um, it has to be someone's job, whether it's someone in HR, whether it's, um, you know, uh, it falls with the, the office managers. It really does have to be the responsibility of someone to get that programming out there, um, because I, I could not agree more that making it visible um, we, we knew, and I, I'm interested in, in your, your sense after a couple of years now, we knew that this was not something that was going to be like flipping a switch and that you could, you know, start, start running WebExes and it, and, you know, you would suddenly magically have a, a, a population that was more well, um, but it is really important to, to, to get the, get the content out there. Um, there's a slide in a couple of slides of, about, um, and a, I would recommend to anyone on the phone, um, the Appendix 8 in the, the well-being uh, report that talks about the different kinds of educational efforts that are really valuable. And as you said, Joe, I think the critical thing there is prevention, right? That, um, you know, I, I think your right. program and our program have really both focused on that. And I think the confidential resources are important. Um, you know, in, in in our case, we the 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 chief, the, the chief wellness officer wears a hat of being um, a resource for attorneys to speak to on a confidential basis. Now, she's not a therapist. She she likens herself to sort of a, a first responder, so to speak. She's trained to spot issues and make referrals if if uh, and as appropriate. Uh, and then, sort of the next tier. Uh, is the employee assistance provider, uh, which is a counsel, which is a service through which employees can access on a free and confidential basis counseling uh, as to uh, life and workplace stressors, and including on, on some issues that 
um, you know, might not um, be the first things that you think about. Um, like, for instance, you know, child care and elder care issues. And I guess those are issues that have become all more pertinent for a lot of people uh, in the last few months. Um, but that, that's a resource that is, that is out there. And again, the idea is to uh, enable your, uh, the organization's employees to, to deal with these issues um, you know, as best they can with the support uh, of, of these institutions and of their colleagues where appropriate before they, um, they present any kind of problems uh, that, that can really impact their performance or, their, or the performance of the firm's work. Hey, this is this is this is this is Tom. I just wanted to make a couple of comments, um, follow up to, to what was just said by Amanda and Joe, and, and and I thank Amanda for for bringing us back home to the point um, that that one key aspect of these well-being programs um, is prevention. Um, you know, stopping bad things before they start. Um, is always the best course of action. Um, I, I would note that when we're talking about um, uh, an organizational setting, um, we can't um, forget that in any organization um, of, of, of lawyers, there's also administrative um, non quote unquote professional staff um, whose, whose interests are, are integral to the success of the firm um, and whose well-being also needs to be factored into um, any type of well-being program um, that people are considering um, to be set up. Um, and they may have very different interests than the, than the, the, the lawyers and the professionals in the firm. Um, and and I, I think those have to be taken into consideration. You know, one of the things that comes up um, routinely, at least in the literature, is 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 a financial um, literacy or a financial competence course um, for people who may not have the same type of education or achieve the educational levels that we have, um, but 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 financial issues are causing stress in their lives. Um, you know, providing um, a, a a program or a course or resources. Um, for people in your firms or in organizations that that um, educate people along those lines and allow them to reduce the stress in their lives it is certainly uh, the type of uh, program or the type of course that can contribute to a successful program. Um, I also think that the leadership issue is important. And although um, I believe we are all leaders in our own rights, um, certainly, the acknowledged leaders of organizations um, need to set the tone for their organizations. Um, and a personal comment uh, along these lines, when I was uh, back in government um, and the division council and the tax exempt in, um, organization, um, we had a nationwide CLE. And instead of a happy hour, um, we had one of our attorneys was a, a yoga instructor, certified yoga instructor. Um, and I asked our, our attorneys um, if, if they wanted something different than a happy hour and if they would consider a, an evening's worth of yoga. Um, and the yoga instructor agreed to instruct and we had a great turnout and, and we didn't have a happy hour. And, and that was actually, um, received quite well um, by the attorneys in my organization at the time. It, it's thinking along those lines and asking people um, what they think would would contribute to their well-being or the well-being of a function is important in building out a program or building out a single event if you don't have a program per se. I think all of that is extremely important. Um, and Tom, Anybody if I could that? just pick, Tom, if I could just pick up on that point, because one of the one of the questions that we had come in was about how you know how do you promote non-stigmatizing of of those who don't want to use alcohol, and and one very simple way is to simply de-emphasize the use of alcohol, um, and that is you know instead of having a happy hour where there is alcohol, 
have other events or have a happy hour that doesn't include alcohol. If you have a happy hour that includes both alcohol and non-alcoholic beverages, don't set things up where you've got, you know, a table full of alcohol and, you know, a, 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 you know one pitcher of lemonade down at the other end of the room. And some of these things are just about the optics of it and how things are presented. Um, and then, you know, as Tom mentioned, you can do things other than, than, than having a happy hour involving alcohol, such as, as yoga, et cetera. I, I, a personal observation, I think most people who know me know this, I, you know, I, I don't drink. Um, and, and, and so uh, I, I, I view happy hours and I usually try to attend all the happy hours I'm invited to when I go to social events and, and bar organizations. Um, but, but being a non-drinker in a room full of people who are where there's nothing but almost nothing but alcohol being offered, um, I have a very different perspective of what 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 that event is is than than the people who are partaking, and people who don't show up are people who who probably feel uncomfortable in that situation. Giving this a little bit of thought ahead of time. Um, and, and thinking about other people's perspectives and, and getting their input, I think is a valuable way to develop or improve any well-being program. So just to make sure that we have enough time to, to deal with uh, COVID-related uh, uh, impacts, I'll, I mentioned this one earlier, but I will turn it over um, to just talk a little bit, um, and I think, this was. I think this is my slide. Yeah. So um, now let me let me yeah let me go ahead and um, quickly highlight some of the other things that the ABA is doing. Uh, you see reference here to uh, the ABA model rule for minimum continuing legal education, uh, recommending uh, that as part of their required hours, lawyers must earn at least one credit hour every three years uh, addressing uh, mental health uh, and substance abuse uh, programming. Um, a number of states have already adopted um, mandatory CLA requirements for mental health and substance abuse education. For instance, uh, Illinois requires two hours every two years. Um, you see here reference to ABA House of Delegates Resolution 105, uh, supporting the goal of reducing mental health and substance use disorders and improving the well-being of lawyers, judges, and law students. And on the next slide, uh, reference to the ABA Working Group. Um, and the pledge uh, that uh, a number of organizations have signed on to supporting a campaign of innovation to improve uh, substance abuse and mental health landscape of the legal profession. Uh, as of this month, we have 181 signatories um, supporting the pledge. Uh, before we and get slide before, before we get to the next slide, which is Amanda's, I just want to highlight the fact that the law firms and other organizations, and there are other organizations that have signed the pledge, um, going back to our leadership point, um, you know, putting putting skin in the game, getting skin in the game is, is, is always a good step to showing your commitment. Um, making a public pledge to support well-being in the legal profession um, certainly is a way to signal to, to the people in the, the, the organizations that have signed the pledge, um, a, a willingness to take a lead and, 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 and take these issues seriously. And, and so signing, the simple matter of signing that pledge is an important first step if steps already haven't been taken in, in, in moving towards uh, implementing uh, a, a better well-being workplace in these organizations. I couldn't agree more. Um, it, it, the, the pledge, I think, was successful beyond the wildest dreams of, of um, you know, those who were uh, involved, and it, it really has taken off to such an extent. It's, um, I think it's, uh, obviously, it's really important to measure progress, um, and it's really hard to measure something unless you, um, you know, are, are asked and tasked with reporting on it. So um, for those of you on, on the line, um, you know, really important to, to be looking at 
um, that pledge. Uh, we wanted to just call out, uh, as I noted earlier, uh, the appendix, uh, appendix eight, or appendix to recommendation eight. These are the kinds of uh, topics, educational topics, preventative topics that um, that you could bring into your organization that uh, really have been found in in a very uh, the, the the evidence is quite clear that emphasis and and steady progress on these topics um, is directly correlated to reductions in sub in substance misuse and mental health problems. Um, the stress management topics are obviously um, front and center. Resilience, mindfulness, uh, which I think uh, with our pandemic, I think has really turned a corner from something that I think was public uh, perceived really in the, you know, in our collective imagination as something that was still a bit woo woo, you know, um, and, and now I think is gaining, it's become very mainstream. Um, we have a, a, a twice weekly live meditation available to all personnel um, that it's quite quick, um, but uh, there are countless um, uh, resources available, free resources. And then of course there are a number of really helpful meditation apps that uh, you could look into yourself, that you could um, offer to your to your workforce, um, uh, conflict management. All of these, it's worth noting, are more important now. Um, you know, you know, how do you how do you you know try to educate on uh, stress mitigation when you're working at home and you have elementary school age children who are also at home? Um, you know, these. Um, there, there's no easy answers to these topics, but now more than ever, I think it's really incumbent upon legal em employers to to emphasize these these questions um, for all the reasons that we talked about at the beginning. You know, because it's going to allow us to deliver the best possible service to our clients. It's going to allow us to avoid, um, on an individual basis and on an enterprise basis, avoid claims and um, disciplinary action. And because we are all uh, working together, you know, for the very human reasons that we're all in this together. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to start to to look at these, whether you're an individual lawyer who's seeking more information. Um, ABA is really a, a wonderful resource and there's all sorts of free content online. Um, I think, Judge, you wanted to just talk briefly about physical activity. Um, I think we all agree that this is at, at or near the top in terms of importance. Um, yeah, I'll say very little on this only because of where we are on time and we want to hit the, the COVID specific items. But, um, you know, people often think of physical activity as a way to achieve physical health benefits. Um, but there is an awful lot of research out there and it's, it's very clear that physical activity also yields mental health benefits. Um, you know, you can look into the chemistry of it and the endorphins that it releases. Everybody's heard of the runner's high all of those kinds of things, those, um, those do result in mental health benefits in addition to the physical benefits that one gets from exercise. Um, and in addition to you know, incorporating exercise into one's daily routine, which can be done, um, uh, uh, lots of ways it can be done, including you know, uh, physically commuting to work um, once offices reopen by um, you know, commuting by running, bicycling, um, or, you know, if you take the metro or a train, you know, get off a stop or two earlier and get a walk in that way. Um, and then for those who are now not, not going into work because of the current pandemic, um, you know, whatever your commuting time is that you have spent in the past, um, I'd ask the question, what are you doing with that time now? Um, because that is time that can be spent getting that physical exercise that people, people so often uh, claim to not have the time to do. And with that, I think we get to the, the COVID-19 specific content. Thanks, Ron. Um, this is Tom again. Um, we are indeed, in, you know, in, in uncharted territory here. Um, you know, I think most, if not all of us, are working from home. Um, most, if not all of us, um, don't have the type of resources available to us at home that we've become accustomed to. Um, most, if not all of us, um, who have client-facing responsibilities are dealing with our clients 
in a very different way than they, they were de dealing with it three or four months ago. Most of us who um, are, have, have court responsibilities, um, whether they're judicial officers or staff, or lawyers um, who are representing clients in court are, are doing things very differently now than they did um, three or four months ago. Um, even those of you who are dealing with government agencies um, uh, are, are dealing with the government agencies to the extent that they still have operations up and running in a very different way than they were doing the first part of the year. Um, but, but all of that presented in the context of of a global, global pandemic um, uh, highlights, um, doesn't necessarily raise new issues, but highlights or, or, or emphasizes issues that people had to deal with before, just not in the way that we have to deal with them now. And, and the literature in the last three months, four months, is replete um, with, 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 with uh, articles and studies about the impact of the global pandemic on, on ordinary lives. And we have a couple of slides here that pick up on some recent articles or commentaries in peer review journals. Um, and the whole peer review process has been exponentially um, sped up in these days. Um, but but they, they highlight key issues for us that, that, that are specifically applicable to our practices in, in the current environment. Um, you know, this, the, the article by Clay and Parker um, talk about um, the potential for spike in alcohol misuse. Um, and I believe, at least in Washington, D.C., the, the local news stations have run um, stories about the increase in alcohol sales. Um, to the extent alcohol is being sold in one of, or more of the local jurisdictions. Um, you know, the, the increase in alcohol use um, can lead, under the right circumstances, to misuse um, of, of both alcohol and potentially other substances. The, the isolation and stress of, of working from home, especially for people who are relatively social in nature and are used to showing up in an office setting and working with their colleagues puts additional stress not only on people who, who, who don't have other problems like alcohol problems or substance problems, but potentially makes the, the alcohol and or substance problems um, a, a lot more risky and a lot more um, with a lot more downside. Um, and the commentary by uh, Nora Volkow um, talks in depth about this. I would note that Nora is the um, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse at NIH um, and is a recognized expert in substance and alcohol use and abuse. Um, the impacts on mental health, uh, working from home um, without the social contact that people normally are attuned to, um, can can be difficult in its own right, but could cause triggers for more serious illnesses, including more serious, serious mental illnesses. Um, serious mental illness needs a trigger, um, and abrupt social isolation um, could, in fact, be a trigger for, for worse things um, to happen. And Fiorillo and Gore would discuss this in some length. Um, and again, um, Chen and, and the other authors um, talk about the importance of settling in with a routine um, that is healthy uh, when you have to deal with issues such as working from home and being isolated from friends and family, uh, coworkers, and even people on the street. Um, and recognizing that you need to compensate and being able to compensate at your own speed um, doing your own things in your own way is critically important to maintaining health and well-being. So just to this, go, just to pick yeah, up. go on, Amanda. Go on, Amanda. Uh, I just wanted to say one thing, which is that um, you know a lot of the, the things that we talked about earlier. It's striking me as you're as you're talking that 
a lot of the things we talk about about leadership, you know, and acknowledgement, you know, having having uh, the leaders of the organizations emphasize that it's okay not to be okay. Um, there's a lot that can be done just purely through communications. You know, I think that there's this sense of, of helplessness um, sometimes about, you know, what can we do when everyone is remote, everyone's isolated, um, over communicate. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you agree, Tom, but that I really do think is the, the most important takeaway. We certainly have the ability to use modern technology to to supplant um, our our more traditional methods of communicating and interacting, and 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 I, I you know whether people have you know Zoom happy hours or or Zoom dinners with families and friends. Um, an important point was made by one of the leaders of the American Public Health Association a few weeks ago. Um, the word social distancing um, is probably not the best term to use. Um, we certainly don't want to be socially distant from from our friends and family and our colleagues um, in, in in today's environment. Um, we actually want to encourage social interaction, um, and so maybe a better term would be spatial distancing or geographic distancing, uh, in, in order to make sure that we're not emphasizing or highlighting the fact that it's okay to be stuck um, at home for months at a time without the normal interaction that, that human nature um, actually requires. The next two slides um, uh, deal with some specific um, ethical considerations that are raised in the current environment um, that we are working under um, and have been working under for the last three months. Um, really on, on slide 32, there's a couple of great articles um, that have been posted recently on ethics um, in, in, in the pandemic environment. Um, and the bullet points on slide 31 um, actually are, are representative of the discussion in these two articles. There are two articles that we picked. Um, there's many, many, many more that you can find online. Um, you know, there's 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 a there, there's no dearth of, of of literature in this regard, um, including by people associated with the with the disciplinary process in some of these jurisdictions, um, including the article by Macaulay that cited here. Amanda, Joe, Judge, do you want to comment about um, the current COVID-19 environment before we move on? Um, uh, I guess I'll, I'll add uh, just something uh, about COVID-19 in part because it comes up in some of the questions that have been submitted online to us. And that is, um, you know, I mentioned uh, health and fitness and one of the questions that came back is, you know, well, how do we do health and fitness with health facilities closed? Um, and uh, I, I, I will tell you from my own personal perspective, I gave up on health facilities about seven years ago. Um, and I know our winters aren't as bad as in some places, but we, you know, I work out uh, year round outdoors. Um, you don't, you know, in order to have a healthy lifestyle, in order to do things that are healthy, you don't need a gym. Um, there are buildings with sets of stairs. There are hills. Um, there are walks. There are runs. There are all kinds of pleasant things that one can do. Even just walking is great for physical health. So um, I, I don't know that one needs to have a, um, uh, a gym facility open in order to get exercise. And I think I, uh, so I would add that oh, in relation to COVID-19 and health. Yeah. That's so true, Judge. I, you know, we we um, we decided to take our our um, our step challenge, which we normally would have um, done uh, by encouraging people to get outside during lunch and you know get their steps in. Um, and we decided to call it a movement challenge. And we are um, are being inspired by all of the videos that are coming out 
of people who are running marathons on their balcony or the, the gentleman in, in the UK who, you know, was a hundred years old and walked around his garden. There's, a, it, there's ways not only to, to do it, to recognize its importance for well-being, to recognize how critical it is now, but for there's ways for legal employers to encourage their um, their, popul- their employee populations to do it safely, um, and in a way that creates more connectedness, creates more engagement. And, and a, a related um, item that came up, and, and unfortunately, I don't know exactly when the question came in, so it's not entirely clear which topic it was related to, but a question came in and whether the court has any procedures or programs in place, and at least as to the fitness item, um, and it, it, this relates to both points, is you know when, when we are, are here in the building and have been here in the building, um, one, one of the things I started when I got here was a, at least once a week, um, uh, on the steps in front of the tax court, uh, just a uh, running the steps with a group of workers, whoever wants to join to join in. Um, and it's a, and, and if, if running steps isn't something somebody can do, they can walk on the steps. And, and it's a way not only to get some physical exercise, but also to get some camaraderie and, um, uh, you know, build human connections. So uh, again, you don't have to have a gym to do things. And, and it's also part of that building camaraderie and giving a sense of belonging. One, one last thing I'll add is as far as the content that employers uh, and vendors uh, can put out in, in this circumstance, sometimes little things really go a long way uh, and, and both in, in terms of creating that sense of belonging and then actually providing some very real practical help. Um, we, we put out a virtual cookbook, you know, because people are doing a lot more cooking, at least some people than, than uh, that's a great in idea. Past. And, and that's been incredibly well received, right? And it's been a way for employees to share and to post uh, just, you know, and then to connect. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that's, uh, that's been fun. And, you know, you can, you, you certainly can transition, some of the other wellness resources to remote media, just like we're transitioning everything else to remote media, right? So you can you can put a uh, a seminar online, you can put a yoga class online, uh, you can do that sort of thing. And really, a, a little bit goes a long way, and it's not necessarily that expensive of an outlay. It's something uh, that yeah. uh, employees tend to appreciate a great deal. Yeah, and there's a whole new state of services that are coming online now um, that are uh, seeking to help employers recreate some of the same sort of icebreakers that you would do. Um, We're we're running our, like like almost all firms, we're running our summer associate program remote, um, fully remote this year. And so we have them set up to do a chocolate tasting, you know, where uh, that they'll all have the same chocolate and you know, be online and be have had it have it be moderated and fun. There's a there's a virtual escape the room. So I think those offerings are only going to grow and become more and more important um, as we just like you said, sort of try to take some of that onboarding experience that you would it's so important um, to that sense of belonging and trying to take it into this new in this in this new remote environment. And though and it's and and that's you know, not a substitute. Preventative... Not a stretch of the word. What's that? Uh, it's not this. I, I, I'll say I don't, I don't think anyone expects it to be a substitute for, you know, the way things were before. No, but, uh, no, it, of course not. But it's it, what we it, have, it, oh, and it, it helps. It, yeah. it, right, it helps. Right. It's what we have, and I think the important connection that we we need to make on the panel here is that it's not a nice to have. It's a must have because in addition to, um, you know, helping the organization work better and serve its clients better, it can be a really critical preventative measure to keep your employee population well, to try to prevent substance misuse, to try to prevent um, the development of, of or exacerbate mental health issues. Um, and it's, it's, it, 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 we really have to acknowledge that the, the social aspects of these kinds of programs are really preventative. So we are- um... Absolutely. The last couple of slides here just just highlight a couple of state specific um, efforts towards wellness. One in Virginia, one in Massachusetts. Um, there's many, 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 many more out there, um, and we have a, a slide that has some basic resources for people who want to look for 
um, uh, wellness program um, uh, literature, uh, including one that's highlighted in the slide specifically developed for the ABA. Um, and I would encourage our panelists to, to look at um, those resources and others. Um, we, we now at a, uh, at our, are at a time when we can address a few audience questions. All attendees can submit questions via the Q&A feature on the webinar interface. And I know um, some of you have. Um, I'll take one here um, that, that asks if there are statistics of mental health and substance abuse problems separately denoted by um, demographic information, um, including law practice and, um, and, and, and location of residence. Um, earlier on in the slides, we cited the Krill article, um, and there is a website that is devoted to um, the law practice. Um, those are resources that I am aware of. Um, I, I, I know the NIH and the CDC and other parts of uh, the HHS department um, have tons of data available, um, including the, the fast stats pages that we cite from uh, early on in the presentation um, have underlying data to support the statistics that we cite. Um, I am not aware of more specific legal statistics out there, um, which is why I thought it was important to highlight um, the recent efforts being taken by the DC Bar um, to survey its members on certain of these issues. Um, but, but, you know, there's a wealth of information um, both at the state and the federal level on statistics that are gathered by the health authorities at those, at those regions. There was a question that came in um, regarding um, social isolation. And again, I don't like to use that term. Um, and and it's, it's similarity or difference to loneliness. Um, does any of the panelists want to address that um, particular question? Uh, which question, Tom? Well, the fact that social isolation is not synonymous with loneliness, and what does that mean? Well, I mean, uh, in part, it goes to the notion of, of understanding and respecting boundaries, and all of that is, um, you know, is individual to individual. Um, you know, it's providing opportunities for that. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. M many employers are... Um, doing things like still holding staff meetings periodically as a way to keep people in touch, which I think is, um, is, is great. And it, it provides an opportunity for people to stay connected. Um, uh, but I, I think we need to be careful that um, somebody, somebody who is not, um, not everybody who is socially isolating is, is, doing so because of the pandemic. And we need to be understand that there are some people who may have mental health issues for which the social isolation is particularly triggering. By the way, there's also the flip side that there is now some, there are some articles out there um, where it's pointing out that there are some people who um, really do need the, the contact with other people and the social isolation does cause or, or um, lead to increased incidence of depression and the like for them. So I, I think the, the point that we need to be clear on all of this is th this really has to be focuses on individuals. I, 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 I completely agree with you that respecting the, the rights of individuals and whether they're the professionals or whether they're um, support staff or administrative staff is key to, um, you know, ensuring that, that an organization is functioning the way it should um, and that people have trust and faith in the way the organization is going to treat them. Um, I would note that we're all lawyers. I don't know if there's any clinicians on the line, um, but I would suggest um, along the lines of several questions that have come in 
that if if for some reason um, you know someone suspects that someone has a problem, whether it's a mental health problem, whether it's a substance problem, whether it's a physical problem, that 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 there needs to be a mechanism where the organization, whether it's a law firm, a company, a court, um, can 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 seek out um, the appropriate professional help uh, to get the right advice um, without playing a doctor um, in real life, which none of us or most of us aren't. Um, and so respecting people's rights along those lines is also key to making these things go well. Um, with that, I think we're, we're pretty much um, at the end of our program. That's all the time we have. Um, but before we leave, I ask all attendees who want CLE credit to stay connected for instructions to get your CLE certificate. Also, please wait for the evaluation to, to come up on your screen. To the faculty for this program, Judge Book, Joe Rolota, and Amanda Smith, Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. On behalf of the ABA, I'm Tom Kane, thanking you all for joining us. Stay safe, stay well, and be healthy. I will now turn you over to our operator for some additional information. Thank you. On behalf of the American Bar Association and the ABA section of taxation, thank you for participating in this program. To learn more about the sponsors, visit the ABA website at www.americanbar.org. Thank you, and please click on the evaluation link. We value your feedback.